Um, mostly I love robots, and so I was talking to the director who has lots of really good scripts that he's never produced because he's so busy producing the other ones. And um, he said that he had one that had to do with robots, so I wanted to read it and um, read it, and it was really good. It's morphed since then. I mean, it morphed into a totally different direction. Well, wait, how did it start? What was it, its original starting thing? It was Planet Crash or something? Yeah, it was called Planet Crash, and it had more to do with a, with a journey. She was more of a mechanic in that, and then it kind of morphed over into her being a... Well, now she's a former pleasure robot and she doesn't know that and so it's kind of what I liked about the script besides the fact that it had to do with robots was that it it has a lot of different angles and depths and twists and so she's she goes through these different stages and she ultimately becomes very different than how she started out and there's all the various things that that affect her and uh, you know us as actors we love things that that affect us we love to be affected you know, so I think that was, um, I loved the direction that it ended up in more so than where it started out, even though I loved where it started out. Uh, my father ran the largest power electronics convention in the world when I was a kid. And so we would go to these conventions and help him out. And I developed this fondness for Edith Cam, who was um, head of robotics, I mean, in our nation. She was like top of it. And so after um, the conventions, and I got to be really close with her over the years, and then I would go and view her warehouses and stuff. And so I actually studied to go into computer science and was very interested in going into that industry myself. But um, I was acting a lot. I didn't have time to finish college. So that didn't quite work out, but it worked out another way. Yeah. And I got to go play with robots later, so I had a happy ending. I think it's inevitable. I think that... Um, you know, where robotics started out, even when I was a kid, you know, they had the walking, talking. Of course, they were controlled by somebody. Now they've, you know, now, now we even look at our iPhones. I mean, they, they kind of think for themselves. They're trained to think for themselves. And so as everything grows, it's artificial intelligence. I mean, we've taught them how to think. And there are actual computer structures that are taught how to think. And they progress and they learn from themselves. And so that becoming something that could overcome, overtake humanity... I would say that would be a really definite possibility at some point in time. It depends on how long human beings evolve and live, but artificial intelligence grows faster than we do even though we started it. So it being able to think itself, you know, think beyond what we can think when it gets to that point, I think it's a, I can see that it would be a realistic thing. Gosh, where are we as far as relevance now? You have to stop and think about that, you know? Um, it could happen. I mean. I, of course, I, in a situation where I just spent the last many, many weeks feeling that it was real, you know, so it's, it's kind of hard to separate what I just experienced from, from what our reality is. But I don't think that in science fiction movies that we would be writing about these possibilities if they weren't things that we actually had fears of, if they weren't things that couldn't actually happen in real life. So, yes, I would say it's a possibility. A probability, I don't know. I can't, I really, can't really guess that. But then again, I just finished living through that. So that's still kind of real to me. Well... I mean, first of all, when you're talking about what, what mindset was I in, I mean, I had the director put, you know, the, the robot that I worked opposite in my office so that it could become real to me because it has to be real to you. And um, before we started shooting, and you have this mindset where you're actually afraid of them. They actually are stronger than us, faster than us, more powerful than us. And um, so it was trying to put an end to that. And But my character also had parts of her that, that were coming up inside of her that were interfering with that, so to speak. And then she had the inner struggle of once she figured out, figures out who she is and what she basically is. And so it's, that's a very confusing journey. It's a very confusing journey to, first of all, be believing it, because in order to perform it, you have to actually believe it. And second of all, to be living through that transformation of yourself. And so it's, it's a very confusing place, but it's it's a fun journey. It was a, it's a fun place to go to. What I had to do is I had to actually take the script and I had to divide it by color codes and divide it by timelines. So, because when you shoot it out of sequence like that, so I had to remind myself, okay, at this point I know this, that, and the other thing. At this point, this had happened. But it was, be, and at this point I knew what I was, and at this point I also knew that. So it was, I had to actually divide it by color so that I could have an emotional reaction to it when I looked at the script without having to go through the journey in my head, I just immediately knew what that color meant to me. I know that's an interesting way to do it, but it's just how I like to do things. And I think I had six colors. We grow up as actors, and a lot of times when you work on the bigger productions, you're acting opposite like a Diet Coke can. So you kind of learn to make that very real. And I had it so real inside my head. 
that I almost found those scenes easier because I already knew how he was going to react. So I could already play that journey in my head. And so when I worked opposite of Hoagland, I, I memorized his lines too. And that way I already knew what I was thinking and how to react and stuff because sometimes we didn't even have the lines going on at the time. So sometimes I had to just replay it through my mind. So it was kind of almost like doing a monologue and reaction, but reacting to Hoagland. And sometimes he wasn't in the scene at all. You know, sometimes we had him in the scene, but sometimes he wasn't there at all. But it's make-believe. I love make-believe. I grew up make-believe. And um, so I would say it was, it was difficult figuring out how I was going to do it, you know, thinking it through. And then I think that when I spent time with the actual robot and kind of personified him, I had to kind of give him a personality. And so it was funny, too, if somebody else read Hoagland's lines, it would sometimes, you know, screw me up. And we had, um, oh, what is his name? Jeff Beach... Beach, Beach no, Jeff Beach no. And when he read Hoagland's lines, it was so easy for me to personify it because he didn't put a lot of inflection in it and he's very consistent. And so then I was able to play inside my head the pre recorded story of how that was going to unfold and how I was going to react to him. My first reaction to Daz was he scared the shit out of me. <laughs> I was like, I mean, he's a really big guy and he's really strong and um, strong features and everything. And he's got a voice that's very, he has a commanding presence to his voice. And um, yeah, I'd watched his audition tape and he was really the only one that I had any sort of emotional reaction to. And the director said, well, what's your emotional reaction to him? And I said, he scares me. He goes, oh, good. <laughs> was like, well, it was difficult, not just because of that, but also because I personally know Ashley through the acting community and I've known her for several years and she's a really good soul. And so it was difficult because I had to be kind of abusive towards her, um, you know, in certain times. I mean, I lost my temper with her a lot. I had to swear at her a lot. And that I didn't expect it to be difficult. I thought, oh, I know Ashley. This will be kind of fun. You know, I love her. She's a great person. And she certainly personified the role. I mean, she's beautiful and she's just everything that was in the script. But I found that it was difficult being harsh towards her. I had to almost kind of apologize to myself afterwards. And a couple times I said, oh, Ashley, I'm so sorry I said that to you. And, or if I had something else that I wanted to add into it, I'd run it past the director. I go, you know, I think this would be kind of interesting if I said this because of, and then I'd run it past Ashley. I go, I need to, I need to let you know that I'm going to be saying this to you, because I didn't want her to her feelings to get hurt as a person. You know, you never know with actors. Like me as an actor, somebody could say anything, and I don't let it affect me. But other actors are different, and so I just kind of, yeah, that was really that was hard. Yeah, and that was interesting. I mean, Tim was a great actor, and. I, I did have to be pretty pretty rough on Tim also. Um, we also had a lot of fun, like in the, the drinking scene and stuff like that. We really had a blast in that. But um, the scene where I throw him to the ground, and um, I don't really want to get into what was happening in that scene because it gives away a little bit of the plot, I believe. But um, I had to really feel those emotions and things, and I'm choking him. And then on his close-up, he, he really wanted it to be really good. And he goes, no, I need you to really choke me. And I'm like, so we had to come up with a, with a, a, a safe word. <laughs> so we came up with the word purple. So if it was like, if he couldn't breathe and he was really going to pass out, because I'm very aggressive, I'm very physical, even though I'm a small person, I'm very physical. And sometimes when you're going through your character, you don't stop to think, oh, am I hurting them? Especially where they're asking you to actually be that more, more that way. And so, but then after a while, it got to be kind of fun to beat up on Tim. I don't know why I got really familiar with him. So there were lots of places where I was supposed to hit him, but then I got to the point where I wanted to hit him. So there's a few parts, we'll have to see if it's in the final version, there's a few parts where I'm like, can I hit him here too? And, can, and then sometimes I just did it and I did it every take. So it would definitely be in there because I thought it was funny after a while. I started to kind of feel her relationship and it, we kind of, de that relationship developed. And as that happened, then you start doing things that those characters would do once it had developed. Yeah, Stephen Manley, oh, he's great. I mean, he can really, he can really find that character deep, deep, deep. And um, I was, I was really happy to see that because he was one of the few actors that we, that we hadn't read just because who he is, you know, he's a great actor. And um, he was just so much fun to work opposite. And, and I like the way that, that, that he really wanted to he really wanted to identify our relationship and our scenes before we did them, which is really, really helpful. And so we'd sit there and we'd talk about our relationship and how we felt about certain things and how... And so I think that made it really interesting once it finally hit on camera, you know, because we were very, very clear before we even shot a frame of what our relationship was and how we felt about everything. Yeah. What was he known for? 
Spock, Star Trek Three, young Spock. Yeah, I mean, how exciting is that, right? I got to work with young Spock. <laughs> but his performance, I have to say, was even more than I think we ever anticipated. Yeah, some of it's because of the mental place that he's in right now in his life, but it was sure working for him. Yeah, we needed to find um, a young a young girl, and the one catch was is at some point in time that throughout the script that her eyes actually get transplanted into mine and so our eyes needed to be very similar we had lots of girls that were willing to do this and and she had to be you know badly burned and all these other things you know prosthetically and so it was like we had some girls and we we're like oh well we'll just use this person I we'd gotten them from my manager and then it was like you know what let's look and see if we can really find somebody that has my eyes how cool would that be on screen and so we put out the call and, um, you know, with a picture so that people could be like, oh, I have her eyes. And everybody thought they had my eyes, which was hilarious. I mean, they've got a lot of people that didn't have my eyes that submitted. And there were about, I'd say like 15 of them where their eyes looked really similar to mine as a child. And then I clicked on this one and she looked like me as a child. And I was like, ooh, that was kind of creepy, you know? It was like, so I ran downstairs and I showed the director. I'm like, you got to check this out. This girl looks like I did as a kid at one stage in my life. And that was Livy um, Steibenroch, who's um, young Anna in Frozen. So that was kind of exciting. And she signed on right away. She was really excited about it. She loved the job. She did a fabulous job. I loved that girl. Her favorite person was Michael Martin, who actually he has, I think, just a few lines in it. He plays the doctor. But he was a ninja. He's a real ninja. And she was really impressed by that because he taught her how to stand to shoot a gun and stuff like that. And she was so excited. So much fun. I got a thank you note from her mom, and that was the thing that she said was the most exciting for her. Yeah, And so much of it was physicality. So much of it was running and falling. And I mean, even when we were out at the Salton Sea with everybody else, it was you know throwing yourself up against walls and falling down and stumbling into broken down buildings. And, and so there was a lot of bruising. There were a lot of war wounds, you know. My knee was all swollen up from, you know, one of them. And it's just, but I'm one of those people, I, I love my war wounds, so I photographed them all. Like, oh, I have pictures of my knee. Oh, I have pictures of this, you know. And then when we went, like, we went to Yuma, we went to, um, we went to the talc mines, we went to um, Toronto Pinnacles. I mean, we were kind of all over the place. And it was just a lot of physicality, you know, a lot of falling, a lot of... Um, a lot of heavy, heavy winds and heat and, you know, some of those scenes that, that look like were nice and cool or whatever. I have ice packs shoved down my shirt and down my back. <laughs> and it was like, and then sometimes I'm carrying a dog. So I'm in a ski jacket and the ski jacket was made for zero temperatures. And I'm in this outfit that's made of neoprene and, you know, I'm holding a dog. And that's, you know, got to be equivalent to a couple hundred degrees. And I did it with a smile on my face. I just use ice packs. <laughs> Aaron, who plays Tycho in the movie, Aaron Jacques is actually my son. And it was kind of his return to movie making. He grew up in the industry and he did quite a bit, mostly commercial when he was younger, but a lot, a lot, a lot. And he had just come back and he'd come back with this cute little dog, moved back home, decided to return to California. And the director was talking to him and he was like, Okay, next thing I know, there's a Tycho in the script, right? So, so that's where that came from. And then um, the script originally had a baby. So we would have needed a baby, and we would have needed probably an electronic baby in order to, you know, use when the baby isn't showing. And then all of a sudden, the baby became a dog. So, and Moose was fantastic on screen, too. I mean, Aaron was great. I was so thrilled with what Aaron did, because you get a little nervous. Oh, gosh, you haven't been in front of a camera in 10 years. And then he just, like, it just was him. So it was fabulous. And then Moose, so we decided to use Moose. Moose was really funny. We'd have to do things to get him to react. The director would throw dirt on the windshield so the dog would go, oh, you know. But um, after a while, it was funny because certain things would actually startle the dog. And um, one, of the, one of the scenes, you know, we see an explosion and I grab the dog and throw myself up against something. And the dog's actually biting me and growling and barking and everything. I'm like, eeks. <laughs> so that was pretty fun. The dog started to get a little tired towards the end of the shoot, though. And I think it's because our characters had become so evolved and it was so real to us now, everything, that the dog started to get scared. So we're supposed to be driving erratically and the dog's like, ugh. Oh. And at first the dog was like, oh, cool, we're going for a wheel driving, you know. And then um, I started to notice the dog's little heart was beating really hard and stuff. And so I said to the director, I said, you know, 
I'll go do these scenes with the car and stuff like that. But I think we ought to give the dog a break because it's all too real for him now. <laughs> it's like, because we're all living this now. We're not acting it anymore. And yes, yeah, so it was pretty fun. Well, it takes place in the same universe as Starship, but I also believe it takes place in the same universe as most movies that Neil Johnson does. It keeps them within the same universe. And, um, which is nice because there can be tie-ins and things can overlap in certain ways and there's storylines that can be gained watching his movies even if they're not meant to be side by side where there's things that will unfold that you'll see in, in the other movies. I know just in some of the things that I've seen of his that like, you know, you'll hear the, the overlord and you'll hear this, you'll have these themes that go through the, the movies even though if you're just watching the movie you may not realize it. So that's a good reason why you should watch all of his movies instead of just watching one or watching a series because there's these little underlying things. Plus he has even props and things that he'll, he's had in all of his movies. And so, you know, you can kind of go through and pick them out. And it's, it's interesting. There's a lot more than meets the eye. It was shot in the same place they shot Return of the Jedi. How cool is that, right? That was probably, gosh, it'd go between the, the most fun and the most challenging that day, those days, um, because, okay, so this is, this is how it went. So the director would say, you see that sand dune way up there? <laughs> and I'd go, yes. And he'd go, okay, I need you to go up to the top of that. I need you to walk around it first, you know, because you don't want to leave footprints. And then uh, this is what I need you to do, okay? And, you know, it's a lot of activity with things that aren't there again, so we're creating it inside of our minds, which, of course, I didn't get right on the first try. And so it's like, okay, go back up to the top and do it again. And as you're walking up, your boots are sinking this far in the sand and they're filling up with sand. And so your feet are like 10 pounds heavier each foot. And so it's really, really hard. And so you're going up and down and up and down, but it's so much fun. You get to roll and carry on and the guns are all banging into you and you're covered in bruises and you get up and do it again. And um, so that was, oh, so then I got to the point he goes, he was yelling action, action, action. And I'm like, I can't hear you. The winds are howling. Everything's blowing. I was the only one out there without sunglasses because it would look silly to have my character running through the desert in sunglasses. So I'm getting pelted with sand in my eyeballs. It's filling my ears. And he'd go, I said action. I go, I didn't hear you, you know. So he came up with this symbol and he goes, okay, well, when I put my arm up like this, he goes, that means action. I go, okay, when I stand up, it means I can do it again. Because I would be so tired from crawling back up there. I'd sit down there huffing and puffing and I'd be like, okay, I can do this again now. So it was really fun. There was a big sandstorm on the second day of shooting, but it just about, just about makes it unbearable because you can't open your eyes. I mean, one time I actually walked to the top of the hill with my sunglasses on and then stuck my sunglasses down my shirt. But then when I was running and rolling, the sunglasses scratched me, so that wasn't such a good idea. But, yeah, it was, it was pelting. I mean, I have no idea how hard those winds were going. Maybe 50, 60 knots, something like that, with that soft, light sand. And so, yeah, it, it, it was challenging and fun, so much fun. <laughs> I think especially because I love science fiction, so I've always seen it. But I wasn't, besides watching making ofs and stuff, I mean, experiencing it is a completely different thing. And so, uh, first of all, I didn't realize how these things were built. I mean, I got to watch it all be built and stuff like that. That was really exciting. And second of all, you're in a, you're in a spaceship like this. <laughs> and um, it, all, it all has to be real and, and your buttons and you're this. And so much is being done in post. So, you know, the things are going to pop up later and all these, uh, you're having to just kind of, live that and it's 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 at first it's challenging and then after oh and carrying the big guns too that's the same thing I mean you just it's not something you do every day not just one gun but you've got your your las welder and your gun and then you've got your big gun and then you've got your super big gun and then you've got your nuke blaster I mean you've got like all these oh you got a knife too I forgot I had a knife too so you know it's it's just different you, you also have to learn how to shoot all of these things and how to hold them all and they're all different you know and but then you're in a spaceship and you're having these journeys and then you have like the space bed and you have the space this and the space that for your different scenes and they have to be real for you. And what they really need to be real for is for the viewer. And so, you know, the, they, they build these sets like this and then you, it has to become real to you in order for it, once everything else gets done, to feel real to the viewer. But um, it's, it's fascinating. And then watching the lighting and everything else and how they do the lighting and... Oh, a funny thing about this one, this is the Chastity Nine, is that Daz, who played Skullcrusher in the film, 
was taller than this. So <laughs> he couldn't even stand all the way up in here. And we cast him after this was built. So it was so funny because after a while I'd be following him in and out the door and I'm bending over inside and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I can stand up. I'm just watching Daz too much because he's like this all the time. It was funny. It's all really funny. I would say that was the most fun movie. Yeah, before that, I had another one, but that was the most fun I've ever had. Most definitely, yeah. You worked with the director before on a couple of things um, at the Edge of Time. I worked with the director on At the Edge of Time, and that one's in post right now, too. I love working with him. He's very good at working with actors. I got mad at him a couple of times, like if I needed more than a, a couple of takes, because I like, I'm kind of known for getting my takes really early on. And um, he'd go, no, I just really... And then I'd be so appreciative because of where we got to, you know. And he's just really, really easy to work with. And he really knows his stuff. I feel bad for the rest of the people in the world that want to make science fiction movies because it's... Um, unless you have an absolutely gigantic budget, I don't think anybody else can do what he does.